Okay, here we are at uh, session five, and uh, our host for this is Professor Toru Hasegawa. Uh, he's a professor at Osaka University in uh, Japan, and it's the middle of the night there. So Toru-san, thank you very much for staying up late, and I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, okay thank you. So, Okay, so uh, let's get the uh, session five started. So uh, anyway, in Japan, so it's almost midnight. So anyway, our first speaker is Chabush Gasami. He's a PhD candidate in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Arizona. Before joining the Internet Research Labs, he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering of information communications and technology. His research interests include information centering networks, control delivery networks, routine forwarding design, name lookup text structure, and so on. Okay, thank you. Anyway, please start, please start the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Chawash, and I'm from University of Arizona. In this talk, I present a real-world comparison between the Indian test period and two leading CDNs on the market, a common and faster. This paper provides an assessment of where the standard Indian deployment stands today and points to future directions. The current internet was designed as a transport network. A transport network only connects endpoints to each other, so applications need to tell the network what machine they want to connect to instead of what content they want. Back in the time, uh, this design made sense because a machine in the network needed to access another machine's resources like tape drive, printer, or processors. But today, it's not the goal any longer. Instead, the majority of applications just want to share and retrieve content so they don't care where in the network the content comes from. This is why content networks emerge. A content network understands uh, what content has been requested and tries to retrieve it from anywhere in the network, whether a cache or the producer. In a content network, some or all of the machines can cache, and requests are forwarded based on the content name rather than the destination's IP address. To implement a content network over the internet, which is an enormous transport network, CDNs have been deployed. So a CDN tries to build a content network on top of the internet with the minimal changes to the internet. ICN and Indian in particular offers a new way to build a content network. And architecturally, Indian offers a simpler and more secure content network by supporting multiple features for content distribution at the forwarding plane. Thus, in this work, we attempt to compare the content networks built by CDNs and NDN to better understand their strengths and limitations. It's also important to, to, to mention that today's CDNs are highly mature complex systems with many different features, while NDN is merely a research with a few prototype software with no production level fitness. So we cannot compare them in all aspects as, as, as if we are comparing two end products. Instead, we limit our um, comparison to the most basic feature of content networks, which is the caching and the retrieval of static contents. To do so, we deployed an adaptive video streaming service and assumed a large number of videos over Akamai, Fastly, and Indian Testbed uh, from four different continents for two weeks. We captured terabytes of traffic on the end user side and the origin side from each network and compared the performance of the networks in terms of quality of experience, origin workload, further resiliency and content secured. In the future slides, I will present the results for each of these metrics. To compare the quality of experience, we compare these networks in terms of video resolution and startup delay. This figure shows the video resolution that the users experience in different locations from different networks. The x-axis shows the network type where A stands for Akamai, F stands for Fastly, and N stands for Indian Testbed. As we can see, Akami and Fastly offers 1080p resolution, which is the full HD resolution, no matter where the end users are. But for Indian, increasing the geographical distance between the end users and the video server, which is uh, located in Arizona, directly affects the video, video resolution that the end users experience. For example, there is a noticeable uh, video resolution gap between the Canadian end users and Asian end users. And the question is why? To answer this question, let's look at this figure. This figure shows the number of Akamai and Fastly servers that contacted the video servers, plus the number of TCP connections that established uh, for a single video streaming. For example, if you take a look at this point, you can see that during 
uh, 90% of all video playbacks fastly downloaded the audio and video files by establishing more than uh, 38 TCP connection by using over 30 uh, different servers. To put it in a different way, this figure shows a heavy parallelization that Akamai and Fastly uses used to, comp to compensate for the geographical distance between the end users and the video server. Because no matter how many files are needed to play back a few seconds of the video, Akamai and Fastly download all those files at once. In the end, however, lack of sufficient resources causes serialization such that the solicited files are downloaded, downloaded one at a time back to back. By increasing the geographical distance between the end user and video server, the effect of this serialization magnifies by multiple times. Another quality of experience factor is the startup delay, which shows how long end users wait uh, till the video starts playing back. As you can see, the startup delay through uh, the Akami and Fastly is mostly below half seconds, but for Indian is mostly over two seconds, and for South American end users is even worse. Understanding why students out from Indian in terms of a startup delay leads us to this figure. The changes in the startup delay mostly come from whether the video is cached in the network, and if so, where in the, how far is the cache from the end users. This figure shows the average round trip time between the end users and the server they're connected to. So as you can see through Akamai and Fastly, the delay between the end users and the server they're connected to was 100% of times below 9 milliseconds. But in end end, end users could find such a good connection only for 14% of the times. So even if the whole video was cached at the server that the end user connected to, the median startup delay in Akamai and Fastly would be six times better than Indian on average, as is shown in this figure. And a clear example of this observation is a high startup delay in South America because the closest Indian server in that area to end users was 148 milliseconds away. Alongside CDN's large deployment coverage, another reason for CDN's high quality of experience is the optimized software implementation. Compared to CDNs, Indian has been mostly an academic project developed and maintained by the research community. Indian software, at least as of today, is merely a prototype of the technology which delivers the basics of Indian design without any production level uh, fitness or optimization. To roughly quantify the performance of the software implementation on Akamai Fastly and Indian testbed, we ran a separate set of experiments to exclude the role of parallelization and large deployment of Akamai and Fastly. But here, for the sake of time, I'm just going to report the results without describing the setup for this new set of experiments. We confirmed that Indian testbed provides end users with the throughput, on average, uh, with a throughput of only 7 megabit per second and 23 megabit per second at, at the best. Um, but in comparison, uh, we can see that Akamai, in our experiments, we could see that uh, Akamai provides end users, on average, uh, with a throughput of 96 megabit per second and fastly 83 megabit per second. And as we can see, there is a, like a big gap between what Indian offers and Akamai and fastly offer. This observation endures the lack of software maturity and Indian test bed is significantly limiting, limiting uh, its performance in the real world. So just to conclude what we discussed up till here, both Akamai and fastly strive for two things. The first one is uh, both Akamai and Fastly try to cache the contents less than a few milliseconds away from the end users, and they try to download contents from the origin using their highly optimized software through massive parallelism. Compared to CDNs, current end end deployment can barely support these two goals due to uh, its software immaturity and lack of large deployment. Now let's compare these networks in terms of the workload they incur to the video server. When we compare the traffic received by the video server from each network during the two-week experiment, we will end up with this figure. This pie chart shows the total amount of traffic received by the video server from all networks, and each slice in this pie chart shows the contribution of each network to the total amount of uh, traffic. For example, we can see that Fastly is accountable for 38% of the total traffic received by the video server from all the three networks. And the big numbers in this figure shows um, the 
actually compare the traffic load of Akamai and Fastly uh, to that of NDN. For example, here we can see that Akamai incurs 1.77 times more traffic load to the video server that NDN does. Uh, there are two main reasons that why NDN incurs less traffic to video servers to, 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 the, to the video server than fast than Akamai. The first reason is a network architecture. And then testbed does not partition the network, so each request from the end user all the way to the video server has a really good chance to meet the cache on the way. However, however in Akamai and Fastly, the network is partitioned to smaller networks, uh, which is called Ireland. Um, the issue is is that if the, if a if if a end user send a request to an island and that island does not have the content, it, it does not check whether the content is cached anywhere else in the network, and it directly fetches the content from the video uh, video server. The second reason is the request aggregation, and then natively aggregates the request for the same content because of uh, using pending interest table. We also confirmed that Fastly supports this feature, but in Akamai, if multiple end users ask for the same content, it will send all those requests to the video server without aggregating them. This also partially explains why Akamai incurs the highest traffic load to the video server. We also compare these content networks in terms of failure resiliency. In a content network, failure resiliency is measured based on content retrieval performance. It means the higher the chance of resolving a content, the more resilient the content network is. Based on this definition, we measure Akamai, Fastly, and NSSPED resiliency. In this scenario, each network catches a specific content in some parts of the network, and then the server stops serving the content. Then end users from different locations try to access the content. As we can see in this table, uh, Akamai and Fastly could serve only less than 14% of the requests, while Indian served 100% of all the requests. That is because all the requests over the testbed have a chance of being uh, served by the testbed machine, which is correct and which is directly connected to the video server, even if the request couldn't find the content anywhere else on the testbed. This is a really good example of when a content is actually available in a CDN, but because of the CDN's network design, the content cannot be served. To summarize what we discussed up till here, we quantify two main issues that come with CDN's network design that cannot be addressed by resource provisioning. The results also show that these two issues are properly answered by the Indian testbed because of its straightforward and plain network design and unique in-network caching features. As the last metric, we want to briefly discuss security models employed by CDNs and NDN. CDNs, like other TCP IP based systems, secure the communication channel between two endpoints by encrypting the traffic at a transport layer, and TLS is probably the most well known technique here. This way, no third parties can see what content is being retrieved, so the privacy and confidentiality of the content is preserved. By using TLS, CDNs guarantee data privacy. And on another hand, uses a data-centric security model in which every data packet is signed by its producer at the time the content is generated. This way, any content receiver in the network can confirm whether the content's payload is modified and whether it actually belongs to an authorized producer. So NDN guarantees the integrity of every piece of content in the network. To better understand the comparison of CD and NDN security models, I'm going to present two common uh, real-world scenarios. But you can find more examples and more details on this topic in the paper. As a first scenario, let's say company X decided to deliver its website to its end users through Akamai. So its end users will contact Akamai servers to access the website. However, the end users' browsers probably refuse to talk to Akamai servers because those servers cannot authenticate themselves as a company X servers. A, company, a, a common approach here is that Akamai asks for the private key of company X. This is, so in this way, Akamai servers can authenticate themselves as a legitimate servers, servers of, of company X. So end users' browsers will accept talking to them. This is, however, a big security leak because private key is never meant to be shared. This, is, this, this issue is rooted in the fact that end users place their trust in the machine they are talking to instead of the content they receive. 
in contrast Indian doesn't have such an issue because the end user can verify the content integrity and its producer which is in this scenario is company X no matter from where and through the through what channel the content is received for the second scenario you can consider this example it's very common that seeding companies modify their customers web pages to embed some controlling information and metadata here the content of the web pages belong to a customer let's, let's say company x but they are generated by the CDN servers upon receiving a user's request. To support such behavior, CDNs again need to access the company access private key. Endian, on the other hand, does not need this. According to Endian's principle, whoever produces the data must sign it. Therefore, content receivers will trust the data they receive only if the entity or the machine that signed it is known as an authorized entity by the original producer. The good news is, by employing a trust schema, Endian enables any producer in the network to explicitly specify what entity or machines in the network are allowed to sign its contents. So considering this example once again, by using Endian security model, a company X could simply specify a CDN company as an authorized entity to sign its content without sharing its private key with the CDN company. This mechanism provides a versatile general purpose way to configure trust in the network and can be readily applied to support dynamically generated contents. So large scale content distribution can highly benefit from Indian's data centric security model because this model lets the contents be safely cached and retrieved by any network machine while enabling content owners to explicitly configure the trust in the network. However, Probably the main issue of Indian security model is a lack of privacy, meaning potentially any machine in the network can see what has been requested. This limitation can be partially addressed by hub-by-hub by hub encryption. However, to the best of our knowledge, this issue is an open problem under active research in ICN and Indian community. Okay, I want to wrap up this talk by sharing some important lessons we learned about current Indian deployment to help future research. As I discussed earlier, lack of sufficient hardware and optimized software is limiting in this performance. Currently, there are only a dozen servers on the testbed that can relay the traffic of our streaming service, and several of them are old machines without sufficient computation and bandwidth capacity. Besides, we clearly observe that the lack of optimization in NFT significantly overshadows Indian's novel design in the real world. For example, we identified and resolved several major software bugs on the testbed that were throttling the system performance, just, just to highlight how important software maturity is before fixing the bugs, the quality of experience numbers that you saw in the previous slides uh, for Indian testbed were at least two times worse. Although some may argue that hardware and software of the testbed do not need to be at the production level, this paper makes it clear that what gives Indian a real shot of being part of the future networking is a production level demonstration and not solely a good design. The second <clears throat> lesson is about applications. At the moment, IP applications and services cannot directly run over Indian. This by itself might not be an issue. However, developing Indian applications is a quite complex and time consuming process. For example, in this work, we spent several months in developing the Indian version of the video streaming service. And this issue has actually been confirmed by uh, multiple other works in the literature. We believe that at this stage of architectural development, what is keenly needed is to run applications and services for daily internet users on the testbed. This not only encourages uh, end users to use this young technology, but it also but, but it also allows researchers to evaluate and measure Indian technologies uh, based on real traffic from real users. Um, as a last lesson in NDN, it's fairly challenging to accurately determine the path that interest takes. This is because a servers treat routing information as a hint and mostly make their forwarding decision based on the, their historical local measurement. In this work, we spend many hours learning how the Indian testbed forwards interest. Uh, for example, during one video streaming session from London, we confirmed that the interest took eight different paths to three different caches in the network. Although such diversity has some uh, benefits like failure resiliency, 
Uh, its combination with lack of a sophisticated monitoring system on the testbed makes it significantly challenging to learn how Indian actually works in the real world. We believe uh, deploying a monitoring and debugging platform on the Indian testbed arguably facilitates not only the network management for administration purposes, but also the network measurement and evaluations for researchers and developers. To conclude, a decade of research and development on Indian technology has produced today's global Indian testbed. And for the first time, we evaluated this network in the wild and compared it with two well-known CDNs by running an adaptive video streaming service and streaming hundreds of videos from different continents. We argue that quality of experience in these networks is mainly determined by their hardware and software maturity. That is why the quality of experience in CDNs is better than in the anticipated at present. We also demonstrated that features such as um, origin workload and failure resilience are mainly the products of the design of these networks. Um, that is where Indian outperforms CDNs. And in the end, we believe that having a resilient and scalable content network is not a matter of a distant future. Indian technology has a great potential to realize such a network if accompanied by mature software, protocols, and sufficient hardware resources. Thank you. Interesting talk. So there are many, uh, there are many uh, questions and comments. So the first question is from Jun Chao. So, okay, maybe so simple question. So first question is the, uh, are you playing the same videos and using the same origin servers for Akamai, Pass3 and Indian Testbed? This is the first, this is the first question to you. Okay, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, um, yeah, so to answer this question, um, for the test that we ran, uh, we use the same video, like we said, we had the same video sets. And uh, we ran that, we ran those video sets for like each of these networks, like Akamai, Fastly, and uh, Indian, and everything else, like including the servers, everything else was uh, exactly the same for all the networks. The only difference that we tried to keep it actually uh, was the network itself. Like we tried to make sure that difference in our uh, comparison mainly come from the differences between the networks, not from our servers or the implementations. The second question is also from the uh, John Sherrill. Also, uh, this is about the uh, exper experimental conditions. Can you configure Akamai and Fastly to use fewer, fewer pops for your video? So that it's a fair, fair anyway, so, uh, it's fair comparison about the distance to the eyeballs, so. Okay, so no, no unfortunately we do not have any access to, uh, we didn't have any access to fast and Akamai and we could not uh, uh, modify or specifically customize the number of pop servers for the publications that we would put to use in this, uh, in, in this comparison. And just to mention that um, the methodology that we used to compare Akamai and FASTA with Indian testbed was uh, we were thinking about these two networks as a black box. So we measure these, like specifically Akamai and FASTA, uh, by monitoring the different types of input and see like what we get in the output. And we try to understand like how these black boxes work. But we didn't have we didn't have any like um, authorization or they didn't have any access to change anything within the network. Okay. So there are uh, okay uh, next one ne next next uh, uh, there are uh, several questions about the security and privacy. Ginger, mm -hmm. Luca, and Dave. So maybe so uh, maybe so uh, they ask. They ask about the uh, assumptions on the privacy and uh, security for both CDNs and uh, LDNs. So uh, they they would like to know the assumptions or uh, uh, this uh, to uh, anyway privacy and securities of the uh, uh, CDN and LDNs. So, so okay, uh, please. Uh, ask the uh, maybe three questions or? Yeah, 
So, um, first of all, thanks, thanks for the question about the security section. So, um, yeah, like, I just want to clarify one point about uh, the security section of the paper. That uh, we, we said in the paper that it's a big topic. It's, it was really hard to tackle in just one uh, section just exactly how civilian security model works versus Indian security model. So our main intention was not drawing any conclusion, was not trying to, even we were not trying to offer any solution. Uh, what we were trying to merely do was saying, um, what is the main purpose or what is the main intention of Indian and what are the main uh, benefits that Indian can offer? Um, but we did not uh, mean to say, okay, so for, for the CDN, because it's using TLS, uh, what it cannot do. We were trying to say what Indian can add to this uh, paradigm or the model that CDNs use. Um, we, we know that uh, there are different aspects to the security, like specifically the TLS has a lot of options, has a lot of, lot of deeper layer and level um, details, but we did not touch those details. And the general idea that we described in that section was um, CDNs mainly care about the privacy because when you exchange the data, because it's a secure tunnel, um, other people, like other entities in the, in the in the network, cannot see what exactly you requested. I mean, they cannot understand what is the traffic is completely like opaque to them. But in Indian, everything is like any, anyone in this network can see exactly what has been requested because the name is is not is not encrypted. So that is a main like a challenge or main drawback of um, Indian security model at the moment. And what we're saying is that Indian has some other benefits, which is the uh, trust schema and the lack of sharing the privacy, the, the, the private key. Because one of the things that CDNs, at least nowadays, they uh, ask and they want, they want the customers, like other companies, to do is sharing the private key with them so end users can actually um, access the content of those companies. So that's the main like picture that we're just trying to describe in section security. We, we were not actually trying to draw a conclusion in that section. If you, Damon Lucas, so uh, do you have comments to the uh, comments or reply to his answer? Mm -hmm. Luca and De Dave, so are you happy with the, his comments? Okay, I think they uh, sent another question. So I wanted to poke at a different aspect of this, mm -hmm. which is um, the, the, one of the potentially really big advantages of NDN involving opportunistic caching is that very little state goes further into the network than the nearest available copy of the content. That's not what CDNs want to do necessarily, right? They may want to reduce latency, but they don't necessarily want to reduce state. So one of the biggest features they provide to customers is audience measurement. And a, a question would be, what do you have to do to NDN that would allow you to do audience measurement without drastically changing the, the, um, the interaction paradigm? So by measurement, I, I believe that you're referring to uh, like monitoring system in the CDNs. Is it, is it right? Well, there's monitoring for performance. There's also there's also audience measurement. Who's watch? You know, how many people in where are watching this video right now? How many of them watched it yesterday? Um, mm -hmm. You know, the fact that you can compress um, and serve the same uh, cache copy to multiple people is great, but you still need to keep the state that, that seven people re requested this rather than one. Right. right? And this needs right. to be globally aggregated, right? So right. that um, you don't have uh, Sybil style um, false audience uh, measurement because consumers are anonymous in NDN. Right, that, that, that's, that's actually a really good comment. Um, so, um, 
so so what actually we return so first of all like in cdn as as all you guys know is it's really like a huge like a uh, system nowadays it has a lot of different uh, building blocks um so what we're trying to focus here was just the content retrieval aspect of it but uh, to answer like the monitoring system like because monitoring system billing system uh, like uh, analytics uh, building blocks and CDNs are huge, like they're very really important. But just to like give it like a, uh, my thoughts, like how NDN, like how NDN can incorporate um, with the monitoring system in CDNs, it would be because like everything is still is under the or it is under the control of the CDN. Like we, we do not say that that CDN is not in charge. Like when we say network, we we're referring to the CDN network. So. Um, still, the CDN uh, owns, like, can monitor, can see all the traffic um, uh, exchange in the network. So, okay. Okay. Let me interrupt. So, almost it's time to <laughs> go to the next okay. session. So, anyway, so uh, we cannot handle the uh, several questions. So, uh, please uh, discuss the uh, the issues in the offline in the Slack. So thank you for the speaker and the okay. uh, the uh, so, so I'll, I'll, just as quick. I will try to answer the question on Slack. I will follow up with you guys on the Slack. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's move to the next <laughs> the next uh, next paper. Also, uh, next speaker is also our also Chambu. <laughs> okay, uh, please start the uh, video. Hi everyone, my name is Chavosh and I'm uh, from University of Arizona. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about RCDN, which is a solution for building a CDN using NDN technology. Simply put, a CDN is an overlay network on top of the internet. It caches and forwards requests based on their name rather than destination's IP address. Upon receiving a request, it will try to find the content somewhere in the network, and if it could not, it will directly fetch it from the original producer. To let uh, CDN servers find the cache contents in the network, a common solution that CDNs use is employing a third-party system module that keeps track of the in-network caches. So when a CDN server receive re receives a request, it will ask this module that whether the content is available anywhere in the network, and if so, what server has it. The main concern with this solution is the lack of scalability that brings many resources to the system and significantly changes the design of the network. So we can ask this question that what if CDNs could find the content without relying on another system component? To put it in a different way, we're thinking about a network that can cache, find, and serve contents at the forwarding plane without a strong dependency on any controlling module. And this network needs to be highly scalable to handle millions of contents. ICN and NDN in particular seems to be able to build such a network. But the question is, does any implementation of NDN necessarily perform as a CDN? The answer is no. Just because a network uses NDN technology it doesn't mean it can be expanded to serve as a CDN. This is because the common networking solution in NDN has a scalability issues. To get a better sense of what this means, consider the NDN testbed. The testbed relies on a routing protocol to disseminate content availability information among the nodes, and this dependency raises two major issues. As a first issue, the routing protocol requires each node to keep information about each content in the network in their FIB, and combining this approach with an ever-increasing number of contents and origins in the network can rapidly lead to FIB explosion. The other issue is that the routing protocol only computes the route from each node to the origins, and it excludes in-network caches. This makes utilizing on-path caches completely opportunistic and off-path caches impossible. Off-path caches refer to the nodes which are not on the path to the origin, but they have the content. So ICDN tries to address these two issues. More specifically, ICDN provides a new design to build a scalable and high-performance NDN-based CDN. To address FIB explosion, ICDN utilizes a full mesh network topology and builds a cache hierarchy on top of it. It also mitigates in-network caching issues by proposing a new forwarding strategy called C strategy, where C stands for uh, CDN. But before we move forward, it's important to mention uh, that CDNs are a profoundly complex ecosystem with many different types of features and services. So we do not have any intention to replace or uh, replicate CDN in this work in any fashion. The only aspect of CDNs that we study is the content sharing and retrieval, which is the most common feature of today's CDNs. 
Okay, now let's see how uh, ICDN's network design works, and then we will discuss the details of C strategy. As I mentioned, ICDN uses a full mesh network topology, just like any other overlay network. It means that there is a one hub virtual link in the virtual link between any pair of nodes in this network, even if physically those nodes are multiple hubs away from each other. However, in majority of CDNs, a routing module prunes the full mesh topology and tightens each node to a small set of paths. But in ICDN, each node can use any path in this full mesh topology at any given time. As another important point, ICDN logically partitions the network for management purposes. It means the administrator can group a number of nodes in the network into one partition, but a partition doesn't uh, cut the actual access of a node to the rest of the network. On top of this network, uh, we built a cache hierarchy to fully utilize in-network caching capability of ending without causing fib explosion. Uh, this figure shows how this cache hierarchy looks like. A very important point is the cache hierarchy is defined only for one namespace or content. So for the rest of the presentation, when I, whenever I mention cache hierarchy, remember that it belongs only to one namespace. For example, here, this cache hierarchy is formed for namespace ABC, and this node is a producer of this namespace. Uh, there are three tiers in this, in this hierarchy, and the very top tier belongs to the nodes that are responsible for caching the contents under the corresponding namespace. We call them RPs, or rendezvous point. To find RPs, we use consistent hashing, so each node uh, hashes the name of the content or the namespace to find the RPs for that specific namespace. The second tier uh, belongs to hot nodes. The main idea here is that in-network caches offer an excellent opportunity for a faster content retrieval. To fully utilize caches, the, the, the in-network caches, the nodes need to announce their cache contents, but we cannot ask them to announce all their contents. The key point here is that the content popularity on today's internet closely follows ZIF, ZIF distribution, and this distribution says that the majority of uh, requests in the, in, in the network are served by a relatively small portion of contents. So we use a decay function to allow each node to choose a small set of their most requested contents as hot contents and announce them to the rest of the nodes within the partition. Uh, this announcement is a routing announcement populated within one partition. So the nodes at this uh, tier, like node Y, believe that the contents under this namespace are popular and hot in the network. The rest of the nodes within one partition which are not RP or hot are considered are, are considered as cold nodes. So based on this hierarchy, we can see that each node in, in one partition offers different level of guarantee of the content availability in their uh, cache for a given namespace. And it's a job of a forwarding strategy to incorporate this information and um, and choose like what node in this hierarchy provides the uh, highest content uh, retrieval performance to retrieve a specific content. So this takes us to C strategy. This strategy uses the cache hierarchy and tries to exploit off-path and on-path caches in the network. When a node experiences a cache maze based on the location of that node in the hierarchy, C strategy chooses some nodes in higher tiers and probes them. For example, if the node is a hot node, C strategy chooses some nodes from RP tiers to uh, probe, not from hot or cold tiers. Uh, after that, it tries to figure out which of the probe nodes provide better content retrieval performance to send the remaining interest to that node. To do so, C strategy uh, uses a weighted moving average for Mula that includes RTT, number of NACs, timeouts, and estimated bandwidth. This strategy captures network changes by periodically um, sending, by, by, by periodically probing more nodes in the network. And if you found a node with significantly higher performance, it will switch to that node. To evaluate ICDN's performance, we compare it against the most common networking solution in NDN, which is using a pro, which is using a routing protocol to populate the FIBs, and after that, using a forwarding strategy to choose um, the the next hub from FIB at any given time. Because this solution is adopted by NDN testbed, we refer to it as the testbed solution. We can pair C strategy in ICDN with ASF, best route, and flooding strategies in um, the testbed solution. We use NDN sim for the simulations, and the request pattern in, the, in all simulations follows zip distribution. 
Um, we use a billion topology as is shown here, and consumers are connected to node 0, 3, and 5, and the producer is connected to node 10. Here, I'm going to present only some of the results, and you can find more results and comparisons in the paper. So this figure shows how fast node 0 downloads different contents in the network. As you can see, C strategy, which is represented by the black line, um, outperforms ASF and best router strategy. And the main reason here is because C strategy fully utilizes in network caching capability of NDN in like either off path or off path caches. Uh, however, compared compared to the uh, flooding strategy, which is represented by the blue line, uh, we can see an interesting observation. Initially, we expected to see that flooding output from C strategy in all cases because it tries to maximize uh, the cache hit ratio in the network. But except for like a few contents. We can see that C strategy uh, shows a better performance than flooding, and that is because flooding overwhelms the network with a huge amount of requests, causing a lot of unnecessary cache eviction on each node, and also it treats all contents in the same way without giving any priority to the hot contents that are more likely to be requested in the future. Uh, in terms of being responsive to network changes, we break an important link in a billion topology, which is shared by several paths while downloading a single content to see how fast uh, each solution reacts to this change. This figure shows that the dependency of ASF and best route, which are represented by, if you follow the red and green lines, uh, th that dependency uh, made these two strategies completely stop serving for a period of time and after, after the routing protocol computed the new paths and updated the feed, they started serving uh, the content. C strategy and uh, flooding, which are represented by black and blue lines, on another hand, immediately switched to another path. And that is because uh, they do not rely on a routing protocol or any centralized controlling module to find an alternative path. And actually, that is why uh, the C strategy and flooding finish downloading this content much uh, sooner than ASF and uh, best route. Finally, in terms of scalability, we study ICDN and test solution by measuring the FIP size on node zero while increasing the number of origins and accordingly contents in a network. By increasing the number of origins in a network, the routing protocol requires FIP on each node to store more and more information, even though a given node, in this example node zero, might never receive any requests for some of the contents in a network. In ICDN, which is represented uh, by the black line, um, we can see that each node's FIB is populated by hot nodes announcement. Thus, no matter how many contents the network serves, the FIB on each node keeps information of a very small group of contents at any given time, which sufficiently helps C strategy tune its forwarding decisions. So to conclude, ICDN is an exclusive network design for large-scale content distribution using any technology. It builds a cache hierarchy among the network nodes and proposes a new forwarding strategy to efficiently forward packets in, in this uh, hierarchy without relying on any centralized controlling module, module or routing protocol. The design of ICDN plus C strategy address FIB explosion and inefficient use of in-network caching in a network. And we do hope that ICDN builds a concrete foundation towards a complete NDN based CDN design and performance evalu evaluation in the future. And thank you. Thank you for the figures. So, currently, sir, someone is uh, typing the questions. So, uh, before uh, he is typed, sir, I have a, a question for the clarification. Sir. Uh, what are the uh, cache sites of the uh, RP uh, hot nodes and the uh, cold nodes? The cache sites are the same uh, three types of nodes? Okay, I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry, can you just repeat the question once again? Okay. Uh, the, uh, my question is uh, the size of the caches of uh -huh. RP and hot nodes are same or not? Oh, so in our evaluation, uh, it was randomly choose from, uh, look, it, it could just go all, all the way up to the 1 million data packets in, in our evaluation, but in the design, there is no restriction. 
each node can have different size of caches, like in our implementation or the, for the design, there is no constraint on the size of the cache. The other question is how about the, the load of the RP? So there are many packets come to the RP. So mm -hmm. well, I, I, I think that the RP is congested. So, I mean, like it highly depends on the, so like the, for, for the RP, it depends like how many contents are actually hashed to that specific node. If one node is responsible to cache a lot of different contents, yeah, that would be the issue. Uh, but because we're using different, uh, like multi-level hash in, hashing in the schema and the consistent hashing, it, it gives us a, like a promise, a good promise to make sure that the content is uniformly um, distributed between different nodes. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's a caveat. Like if a lot of contents are hashed at the same node, uh, mm -hmm. that node can get overwhelmed. That's yeah. a good question. Yeah, so uh, hashing works, hashing, uh, works to better uh, load balance, okay? So please the uh, Slack, so uh, there is some co uh, question from the, uh, okay. Two thing, all thing. So I let, so I have a question regarding the central control in the context of a CDN. It indeed has some scalability challenges, but it comes with several advantages, especially the global view on the network that may be very useful in terms of network management, blah, blah, blah. There's a trade to be hope of between the scalability and manageability, isn't it? Please. Yeah. Um, th thanks for the question. That's exactly true. Uh, as, as I said, like in, the, in, the, in the one of the first slides, uh, CDNs have a lot of, lot of different building blocks and features and management and analytics uh, building blocks are really important in the CDN. And exactly, like management and like the administration in, in CDN comes from the centralized design or semi-centralized design the CDNs have. So with no doubt that that's a, like a really good benefit or the big benefit of CDNs. In NDN, as I've mentioned in the previous uh, paper, we do not have this. We don't have this kind of management scale up in the, in the platform. And that's kind of a to-do thing in, in the Indian list. Okay, we need to get there. Um, so I totally agree by using NDN, I, I, I'm just not sure like how the management will exactly work in the real world. Um, but what I can say is we will have some like, challenges to solve if actually we want to use NDN as a CDN, um, like a platform. So, okay. Is there any comments or questions from the floor? Okay, thank you. So uh, let's move to the uh, next, uh, next, next paper. Okay, thank you. The last speaker uh, is the... Uh, or a nose, anyway, Greg. Uh, Greg is chair of the uh, computer science department at the Colorado State University. He is a former chair of the SMCCOM, a fellow of SMN and I3P, and a member of the Internet Hall of Fame. Okay, thank you. Please start the video. Hi, everyone. This is Craig Partridge of Colorado State University. And I'm here to present the paper on discovering in-network caching policies in NDN networks from a measurement perspective. And this is joint work with Chen Yu Fan, Susmit Shanagrahi, Christos and Christos Papadopoulos, as well as myself. Um, this is actually part of Chen Yu's uh, doctoral dissertation work. I'm here speaking as his thesis advisor because Chen Yu was unable to record uh, the video, um, and I'm going to take a little bit of advantage of that to do a little bit of meta discussion of where I think this work fits into a larger context as I go through the work. So um, let's just think about a broad problem. You have built a service on top of NDN, and you have a customer call up and say, I'm not getting good quality service out of your you know, over, overlay service. How do you, as an application service provider, figure out what the NDN 
network being provided by commercial network providers is doing to your data such that your customer is not getting good service. Okay. Over the years, IP networks built up a large array of measurement tools to allow you to begin to figure out what the customer is experiencing. A couple of basic things that we learned in the development of those tools is one is if you're an end user or you're an, an, an upper layer user, that is you are running on top of NDM, the service provider is not going to try to help you. So you will not be able to send queries to the NDM routers and say, oh, by the way, tell me your caching policies and your forwarding policies and everything else. The answer is that the carrier is going to say, mm, you don't get that. So you have to end up doing edge measurements, perhaps with your own additional internal infrastructure that you own, to figure out what's really going on. And in NDN, there are all sorts of interesting complications um, because um, caching policies, forwarding policies can vary based on individual names. So it may be, that, you know, I've got, you know, I'm slash Craig's nifty service is my, you know, prefix. And I can pay service providers to give special types of handling to Craig's nifty service. And then I have to verify that I'm getting the handling that I paid for. So my customer is happy. Further complication is that NDN has far more in-network states than does an IP network. In particular, the presence of the cache means that you have a whole set of caching policies about what information to cache, when to discard information from the cache. Um, you have different forwarding strategies. As we said, you can forward based on individual names in various ways, even though they're going to the same, the information is going to the same place, the name changes how it's forwarded. So you have this incredibly complex network that you need to understand from the edge. And what Chen Yu set out to do in his dissertation was to look at different ways to try to figure out from the edge what NDN is doing. And of course, the other th meta comment to make here is that that's not an easy problem because unlike you know, typical data networks where you can fire a packet into the network anytime you want and you've got a reasonably high probability in most situations of getting a response, in the end-to-end -end world, the only thing you can do is request data using an interest and, and hope that you get data, a data message back and you don't even control who responds to your interest. And so your challenge is that you have a network which is in fact designed to be very smart but therefore relatively opaque in a lot of its dealings. Okay. So, the goal here that we the Chen Yu set out for himself, and which I believe very surprisingly to a lot of us he succeeded, was to try to detect caching decisions, that is, when routers decide to cache your data from an edge measurement. Okay. So just to be clear here, caching policy in an Indian router has at least two parts. One is what do you decide to cache? That's your caching decision. So you've, got, you've been presented with a piece of data and you look at it and you say, will I, will I cache this? Do I want to cache this? And then the second issue is, if you've decided to cache something and the cache is full, what's your policy about what you throw out of the cache to put the new item in? Okay. Other thing here is different NDN providers, indeed even different NDN routers within a provider, may make different sets of decisions and may have different cache replacement policies. So long term, what you'd like to be able to do is figure out what's going on there at each hop and figure out if any of those caching policies are, for example, in conflict. Now, for the purposes, this was a wide open problem. So for the purposes of this work, we made a few assumptions. One was that we were following a best route forwarding, forwarding strategy and that everybody used the same caching decision policy, that is to say, they made the same decisions about when to cache and they um, you know, uniformly in the network. They also all used the same cache replacement policy, priority FIFO cache replacement. And we assume that there's a single producer of the data that we are seeking with our interest packets. Now we'll talk at the very end about loosening some of these restrictions, but as a starting point, perfectly reasonable. Can I figure out you know, you know, a, a uniform space, do I have any hope of figuring out what it's doing? Now, 
we did look at the, uh, the different caching decisions that the policies that have been developed for NDN. So there are a lot of them. And I'm just going to run them down very briefly here. There's cache everything everywhere. This basically says, if you receive a piece of data, you do your best to cache it. Okay. There's leave copy down. Leave copy down seeks to arrange things so that you cache uh, one hop away from where it was retrieved. Okay. So at each step, you're trying to get one step close. If data is requested multiple times in the same part of the network, it will progressively work its way down the path. There is label caching, in which by um, the, the, the router basically computes based on a, a label and a cache, a, a name of the chunk, whether to cache the data according to some probability, or actually not to probability, but according to some function. There are then probabilistic caching schemes, in which you basically flip a weighted coin and decide whether to cache this or not. Um, and then there are more dynamic schemes that attempt to think about where you are between the source of the data and the source of the interest. So how did Chen Yu figure out how to measure things? Well, he did the following thing. You've got a client, you've got a producer, the server is the producer. You've got your own target prefix, which is an obscure prefix that you believe others aren't using. Okay. And what you do is you send out 50 different interests for that prefix. You get an answer for each interest. You save the hop count. You save how far away the chunk, how many hops through the network the chunk took. And then you repeat this step again and again and again and again. Okay. Note that as you repeat, the caches in the path will begin to, to um, service the request. So the response times, the, the, the amount, the number of hops the, net, the traffic has to take is going to change. The amount of time, if you want to think about time instead of hops, the amount of time it's going to take to fulfill your request is going to change as you repeat this process. And then what you do is you plot the distribution of the hops time required to get an answer as you go forward. So let's just look at LCD, which seeks to, to do things one hop down, okay? So the first time you request it, an answer comes back. What's more, the data chunks are all cached in R3, the one hop away from the producer. So now you request second time, and you're going to get the answers back. They're all going to come back from R3, so it's going to take less time, or it's going to go through fewer hops, whichever way you want to think about it. Okay, and furthermore, you're going to populate R2, and so on. You'll populate R1. So essentially, at each round, you will see a consistently shorter response time because of the caching for each of your requests. So in fact, LCD will in fact trace out in some sense the hop count and the delays between the routers in response to the series of requests. All right, so we actually simulated this in NDN Sim using a linear topology of 10 routers. With This is basically how we did most of the initial work um, and you can identify the caching decision based on the hop distribution in each round. Okay, so how close is the data and the change across the multiple rounds. So these are the things you're going to be looking at in the charts is how far away was some, something and you know what's the distribution of responses and how does that evolve over time and here you can see in LCD as noted on a 10 hop system you can observe the responses shifting hop by hop it's getting closer every single time and it's a stair function okay and this turns out to be the fingerprint for LCD now if you look at other caching mechanisms you get other fingerprints so cache everything everywhere. The answer is once you ask, 
everything is cached at the nearest, everything is handled by the nearest router because it's cached at every router in the past. So what you see is the first request, long de delay and everything else, bam, it's right next to you. All right. If you're doing label caching, which remember is sort of this, um, you know, pre-assigned uh, trick to figure out if, you know, computation to figure out if this router is one you should cache in, you get these things that look sort of like inverted missiles. Um, and if you do probabilistic caching and it's statistic, you know, it's static, say a 50% uh, uh, percent chance of caching at any given time, you get graphs that look like the one on the right, which is to say you see a certain distribution of responses in terms of their distance. And of course, as you request more, those folks who had a random flip the first time to say not cash have a 50% chance of on the second time saying, oh yes, I will cash. And so what you see is this distribution getting squashed the farther along you go in terms of requests. Now, I just want to stop here for a moment because I find this a really beautiful result in and of itself. If you look at LCD, you look at CEE, you look at label caching, you look at probabilistic caching, just from these plots at the edge, you know which caching scheme is in use in your network. And that's a really interesting discovery. And I will say, certainly I, as Chen Yu's thesis advisor and a number of other people who were advising him were sort of stunned when he came back <clears throat> one day with these graphs and said, look, I can actually see this stuff. And the key point here is it means the innards of the network are visible to higher layer users at the edge. Um, some other statistics here. Here are cases of caching probability 80, probability 20, dynamic probabilistic caching. You'll notice they have slightly different configurations. Um, the interesting thing is that you can actually start to figure out what the caching probabilities are that are in use by the shapes of these graphs. So here's another fascinating result. It's not just, I can tell you if it's LCD or EE or probabilistic, I can actually, for the probabilistic ones, start to estimate what the probability being used to cache data is. All right. Um, and that's a really fascinating result. Uh, notice, for example, that um, the probability cache INV, I'm actually looking to some degree at the state of my cache, so I'm actually able to also start estimating the states of, states of caches and their inner behavior. All really interesting possibilities to extend. Okay. Now, if you're a researcher and you're looking at this, you're saying immediately, well, okay, guys, nice, pretty linear topology, but what about cross traffic? And what happens when cash replacement comes into play? Okay, so we did some, Chen Yu duly did some work on this, right? So you send your request off, it comes back, it's cached, that's nifty, but then cross traffic shows up. Boom, and the cross traffic fills up the cache and eventually obliterates your cached item. Um, so do we still see these patterns? Um, and the answer is yes. Okay, so um, we did two experiments. We did some cross traffic near the client and we did some cross traffic near the producer. And what you see here, and this is the probability 20%, is that you still see the same general shape of curves, okay? Um, things are still cached, your data, you know, your data is still cached, cached with some probability in the path, and we see similar patterns to the ones we saw before, so you would still recognize this as probabilistic caching. All good. Um, one interesting one is uh, LCD actually does change a fair bit, all right? You'll notice that the stair step process on the left, when, they, when we're running cross traffic near the client, becomes um, more stochastic because the cross traffic may drive out 
cached entries. And so we start to see a distribution as we go farther along. We see a stair step followed by a little bit of a distribution function. Flip side, if it's at the server end of the path, what we see is that our cache is routinely getting nuked and so our cache entry is being nuked, so we actually never really progress from there. Um, so, but I want to point out that even so, notice that LCD is still easily distinguishable from the probabilistic mechanisms in that you see stair steps or lack of stair steps, but you don't see these grand rich distributions. Now, you might imagine that if you played very carefully, you might be able to set up a set of tiered cross-traffic situations so that LCD becomes more stochastic. But even so, it looks from the graph on the left as if we'll continue to see some form of stair-stepping and be able to distinguish it. All right, so I mentioned, and I'm going to cover this quickly, um, that we can estimate the static probabilistic value. As I noted, the shapes differ according to your probability function. And so you can estimate what the static probability function being used is. And I find that tremendously powerful. All right, so now the other thing you're gonna say is, guys, you were doing static topology, yada, yada, yada. Um, but let's try something a little more real. And by the way, the NDN stack doesn't expose the hop count app information to applications. And we're an application, so what are we going to do about that? So we actually generated a, a random topology that seemed reasonably realistic, and we ran the same simulations, and we assumed that we didn't actually get to see the hop counts. Um, and things got a little bit tricky. In particular, we had some challenges figuring out, in some cases, what the hop count was due to varying delays and links, del delays between hops that were not uniform. So we got these sort of funny little curves, particularly as we were getting farther away. Um, and as I said, link delays are not necessarily fully matching with hops. So what do you do? So it turns out that what you do is you find some way to cluster delays and say, you know, this cluster of delays is this hop and this cluster of delays is this hop. The particular clustering algorithm that we used was k-means. And if you do that, and so you sort of clean up your delay information to create a series of distinct hops, then in fact, what you see is the same graphs that you saw earlier. So the answer is the end system, even though it is not told the end-to-end -end hop count, is in a position to actually uh, estimate um, these uh, hop graphs. Okay, so I'm at the end. Um, and I'm gonna, I've got two slides, so I'm going to go briskly. First, um, interesting thing number one, here we are. We have a way to actually figure out how the network is caching our data internally. And we can tell you at the end host in the application what's going on, what caching policy is in place, and it seems to be robust to cross traffic. And you can even estimate the probability function in use. And we've done this even with simulated real topologies and we've worked out some of the issues that the real topologies pose. Now, if you're gonna go forward, obviously you'd like to look at this on a real test bed. You'd obviously like to experiment with more caching mechanisms. Um, you would also like to understand the effects of other cache replacement policies. And you'd like to start seeing people use this, so you'd like to integrate it into the measurement framework. Um, you also, at some point, want to look at multiple producers and a range of mixed forwarding strategies. But, you know, and this is just a guess, but historically, results like this, where you actually find certain traffic patterns and you've shown that they're robust to at least a little bit of cross-traffic, it tends to be true that they persist. So I think the probability is that these results will be very strong and and that they're a good way of pointing us towards uh, a future um, set of tools that use this kind of information, traffic patterns, cache pattern responses, to tell us quite a bit about the innards of NDN networks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for correct. So there are several questions uh, from the uh, 
track. So first question is the Junshiro. So uh, I see your figuring out the hop count by using uh, using end trace. So this is a big assumption that network operator are, allows you to trace loop in the networks. So his question is if a trace root is permitted, IGN trace root can already tell you where are the cache objects. Right. So it's good. Um, and I answered that in the chat and I'll answer it here. We actually, that was a question asked early in the talk and at the end of the talk, we indicated that in fact, we don't assume the operator tells us uh, the hop count and that we actually infer it from the edge uh, using the clustering of delays. So, yeah. So uh, the second question is from Dave. Dave so uh, one potential phenomenon that might make this unacceptable. And uh, some recent proposal for uh, adaptive video have caches artificially uh, delay response to mimic the latency of talk, take, uh, talking to the origins. Anyway, so if uh, Mr. his question is what happens if uh, Artificial, artificial delay is interest by the application, by the applications. Right. Um, so the answer is Dave's right. If you, if they do that, it may distort our ability to measure. It may not. It depends a lot on the particular delay policy. Um, you can, you know, in some cases it turns out when you use algorithms like this that the delay, artificial delays, turn out to be white noise. And so they don't affect the curves. Um, in other cases, they're very structured noise and you can delete them um, because you can infer that they're there or you can try it with some structure. Um, but it's also possible that yes, that would undo this. And we will just have to see, Dave, I'm sorry. It's a great, great question, but you know, the answers we'll just have to find out. Okay, so uh, John has some comments on the uh, David, David question. So uh, John, do you have some comments or the answer? Uh, comment, comments or uh, a question about the artificial uh, DI? Okay. So let's see. Okay. Try the one on the, the is this what is this Alex's question about real networks are complicated? Or uh, yeah. are you asking John to say? Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to answer Alex's question for now while John figures out what the, what he wants to ask. So uh, real networks are complex. Yes, of course they are, and they may employ multiple caching strategies. Yes, our hypothesis, which we have not checked, Alex, is that what you will see in such situations is you'll see hybrids of the different slides. So if I'm doing you know two different caching mechanisms, a probabilistic one in one part of the network and say LCD in another, I'll see a stair step, then I'll see a probability distribution and that you'll be able to indeed infer where the boundaries are between the different caching policies. But that's something we have to experiment with, right? So, um, uh, there was a question about whether we consider using ML to match the patterns, of course. Um, not part of this work, uh, this work was to show that you could actually envision doing this kind of edge capture. Um, anyway, okay. Anyway, so I have a, uh, I have a similar doubt about the topology. So anyway, linear topology is very <laughs> easy. So if the topology is three, so I'm not I'm not confident you are you are you are uh, whether your system or your algorithm works well or not. Okay. It's comments, so not question. It's it's a perfectly good question. As I say, we did do some realistic topologies using rocket fuel laid on NDN sim, and we still saw the same patterns, which suggests that it will be robust. But again, we have to do much more testing. You're quite right. There are reasons to be skeptical. I'm from past experience doing this kind of measurement. I am, as I said at the end, my guess is we will discover that in fact we learn quite a bit. That, it, that, we, that this says that there will be characteristics, but you're quite right. Richer topologies, adding delays in some of the caches, uh, varying policies across different parts of the network. At that point, it's all a hypothesis. 
All we have shown here is that for simple topologies with cross traffic, it works. Now, that's usually very promising. So I see my internet has gone unstable. I think that so, uh, I, uh, pretty, uh, precisely saying so. I'm, I'm not skeptical about your uh, results. So maybe so you should do the uh, DR experiments on the many topologies. So anyway, so there is another question from the Dave. So uh, another assumption, uh, okay, anyway, another assumption is that probe traffic is small enough that it, it doesn't bias the Kirsty Prisman's actions. How do you think? Um, I would hope it's small enough, Dave, yes, but it's, a, it's another very good question. If someone decided to deploy um, for example, an NDN router with a small cache, then yes, our probe traffic will distort the results. And um, given all the discussions in the internet world about exactly how big a router cache should be in this day and age, I can imagine someone playing with it. Um, so. Another question from the Ken. So. Ken is expressing hopes that I'm right, for which I am grateful. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think PathCare is, uh, you know, I've always been amazed by what you can do with that. So uh, I think this is kind of the same ideas, some of the same ideas here. Sure. Anyway, sir, I have a question about the, for clarifications. Anyway, sir, are you algorithms? can infer the locations of the cache uh, uh, contents. So, but so how about the uh, cache eviction policies? For example, the, uh, in, the, in the paper, the uh, uh, estimating the uh, inferring the caching eviction policies is an example. So do you plan to uh, infer uh, cache eviction policies like uh, LRU and LFU and the, some other cash eviction policies. I think that this is very difficult. Um, right, it is very difficult. And cash eviction policies will also change the results, particularly with cross traffic. Um, we, we did not explore that problem. I agree with you, it will have to be explored. Uh, it was just not part of the work that we did in this particular paper. So. I agree it's an issue. Okay. So are there any questions, comments from the audience? Okay. From Dave. So are there are another comment from the Dave. Oh well, we're just having a little private conversation here. Let's move on. Not sure. <laughs> okay. So are there any questions? Oh, come on, Dave. Let's have a big fight. No, okay. <laughs> uh, we have uh, a few minutes. So no, I, I was just pointing out that um, it would be real nice if, uh, if the optimistic path care uh, mm -hmm. results carried over. But my skepticism is that the time constants on links relative to the probing is order milliseconds, whereas caches uh, if they're going to work reasonably, you have to have uh, time constants for stability on the order of minutes to hours. Okay. Thank you. Okay. But that um, should argue, Dave, shouldn't that argue that some of the behavior will be more stable and that this, this characterization should therefore be easier? Okay. Okay. Anyways, thank you. So anyway, it's almost a time. So may, may, maybe you're right. It might be even better. Right. Okay. Uh, anyway, thank you for the, uh, all the presenters and the uh, audience. So uh, let's get the session uh, finished.